Hi, everyone. This is Lisa Ackerman. I'm the executive director of TACA, and I'm super excited to have Dr. Robert Navio um, here from UC San Diego. Uh, he's our leading researcher in the field of treatments for autism, and I am so excited to bring this interview and update. Hi, Bob. Hi, Lisa. So we've featured your work in this work so many times. It's been on our blog four times. The last update was May 2020. And there are even more details. You can go and find all the past blogs at takanowblog.com or at the links below. We wanted to share this update um, on this very important field of research in autism. Uh, so this interview is going to start from the beginning. So if you're brand new to this work, welcome. And this will give you background and an introduction to all of the research that we're going to be talking about. And if you've been following along on the Suriman research, um, you're going to hear some duplicate questions, but we will get to an update at the end. There's been a lot of, of information transpiring since 2017 on this topic. So let's get started. So um, Bob, you and I've been friends a long time. Um, uh, I always want to share with folks watching, um, please share a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure. Thank you so much, Lisa. So I still remember the first time we met at the TACA conference in 2013 when you greeted me so warmly and, and had already read our first publication on the use of sermon in a mouse model with autism-like behaviors. And, you know, I learned so much at that first TACA meeting for me, and, and I've been a huge fan of you and your work at TACA ever since. So for the people viewing, I'm a professor of genetics at the University of California, San Diego the School of Medicine, and my specialty is mitochondrial medicine, human genetics, and inborn errors of metabolism. So my lab studies how mitochondria are involved in complex disorders, both in children and in adults. And I'm the founder of the Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease Center here at UCSD and a co-founder and former president of the Mitochondrial Medicine Society. And so on the mitochondria side of our, our research, my lab is known for solving a 70 year old medical mystery. And in 18, in 18, in 2004, we discovered a uh, genetic cause of the oldest uh, Mendelian form of mitochondrial disease called Alpers syndrome. It causes seizures and liver failure in children. Such important work. And we're so grateful for what you do, Bob. So how did we, um, how did we embark your field of research in autism? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, in 2001, you know, my lab helped uh, make the discovery of the first mitochondrial DNA mutations that cause autism spectrum disorder. Um, and then later in 2008, I was asked by the former chairman of the board of the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, Dan Wright, to take a, take a, a look at autism and see if I might be able to, to um, come up with a way to help. Dan had recognize that autism in the US was increasing at an alarming pace and, and was you know, becoming a national epidemic. So in 2009, we traced the metabolic changes needed to respond to environmental stresses of any kind and for healing you know, after any injury to mitochondria. And, and then in a few more years, we had received the, the Trailblazer Award for autism uh, from autism speaks in 2011 to test a new idea and this was a new theory um, to explain the cause and treatment of autism and that theory was caused uh, called by um, the cell danger response or cdr hypothesis so and throughout my career in medicine i've always wanted to be a voice for children who couldn't speak for themselves who had no voice and in the the beginning that was children with mitochondrial disease and later I learned of the need of children and families affected by autism spectrum disorder. And then from then on, getting to know the children and their families and um, uh, with mitochondrial disease and autism made me want to be a voice for empowerment and hope for each of these children and their families. And so our research team has been dedicated to this ever since. Oh, that's so wonderful. And for folks who don't know much about autism, they say it's over 40% are non-speaking. Um, and just because they can't speak doesn't mean they don't understand or don't have anything to say. Right. So your work is so important. So thank you. And all right, I'll get back. Um, you and your lab at UCSD have been involved in some really great mitochondrial work and immune and autism research. Tell us how you started looking at Suramin. 
you know so the the most important clues that um, put us onto this trail came from actually seeing children in the in the medical clinic with classic forms of mitochondrial disease like Lee syndrome, and then also children with classical autism spectrum disorder. And and the symptoms of the children were different in those you know two large you know classes of disorders, but um, they were connected in ways that made me think that mitochondria could actually be involved in both, just in different ways. And so children with mitochondrial disease often had a decreased sensitivity to touch and light and sound and touch and and many uh, and taste. And many uh, of you know um, the mitochondrial children were quite social and eagerly made eye contact, um, but you know um, could not move or you know um, walk around and explore uh, the, the office. And so the, also the symptoms of mitochondrial disease were progressive, also, you know, often leading to neurodegeneration and um, failure of one organ system after another um, and to death in the first few years of life. Um, uh, in, on the other hand, children with autism uh, were often, often had an increased sensitivity to touch, light, sound, and taste. Um, they were hypersensitive, not hyposensitive, and they avoided eye contact and were not social towards strangers. Um, so, and then they would be, many were eager to explore every nook and cranny of the office when they came in, <laughs> okay? Um, so children with ASD did not have progressive organ failure um, um, and, and did not have progressive neurodegeneration. So the and they had a biology that was compatible with a long life. So we test a lot of different theories to explain this difference between the two disorders. And none of the early explanations stood up to you know, the test of time. So two of the early ones where we looked at mitochondrial DNA mutations, we found a few, um, but it wasn't the, you know, it wasn't present in even more than a, a few percent of, of children. We looked at how much mitochondrial DNA there was in a cell. Those are copy numbers. We looked at total ATP from muscle biopsies. And, and, and ultimately, none of these panned out. And, and the, the, the overall ATP levels, um, you know, uh, both inside and outside the cell, were the same um, in both autism and, and, um, uh, and and typically developing children. So we knew that um, it wasn't as simple as just the amount of energy that the that mitochondria made. So we thought that if it's not about total energy, total ATP, maybe it could be the location of where the ATP was. And so inside the cell, ATP is a good thing. It's, you know, an energy carrier. It's a conventional metabolite that has many, many jobs in the in the cell. It's the you know standard currency of exchange um, for for energy and work in the cell. But out, but if, if ATP gets outside the cell, it's a bad thing because it signals cell danger, okay, to other cells and causes inflammatory cells to to come in. It can activate microglia in the brain, for example. And so um, Jeff Bernstock. Um, had discovered what we call purinergic signaling by extracellular ATP back in 1971, but I was completely ignorant of that, and nobody I knew here at UCSD had ever heard of it either. So, so we had to, to, to we had a, a a rapid learning curve in order to really um, get up to speed about how um, ATP outside of cells was a danger signal, and so we test this this idea. Um, uh, about purinergic signaling and the cell danger response um, as possible universal features of ASD. And I, but I needed a way of doing that. And, and um, there were, uh, you know, so, so I looked through over 2,000 different um, medicines that were currently available in the, the world's pharmacopoeia, um, looking for any one that could actually um, regulate this pathway, okay? Regulate, be a, an inhibitor of extracellular ATP signaling. And ultimately what I found is um, that there was just one drug, <laughs> one drug, and it was uh, a drug named Suramin that had actually been made back in, you know, many years ago, and I'll go into that later, so.
Scott. I, I every day thank for you. Thank you for your curiosity and uh, wanting to find answers. And uh, and you stumbled on sermon. So what is what is sermon? Yeah, sermon's a, a man-made drug that was first made in 1916 to treat African sleeping sickness um, caused by a little parasite um, known as a trypanosome um, that. You know, the sickness is transmitted by the bite of the tsetse fly in Africa. And Suramen has been made by Bayer in Germany ever since. Um, and and the, these interesting pharmacologic properties, the antipurinergic properties of Suramen, were unknown until 1988. So many, many years after um, uh, it had already been used to treat sleeping sickness. And so... The synthesis of suramin is complicated, it involves several building blocks that are um, that are commonly used in dyes or, or textiles. Um, but even today, the best chemists in the world, um, the synthesis of suramin still involves many steps and high purity um, uh, compound in large quantities is very difficult to produce. Interesting. So let's go back. How did you even think to think that sermon could be useful in the field of autism? Yeah, it's because I thought that it was that autism symptoms were caused by the body's response to extracellular stress or to, in, well, and to, to it, in some children, it's, you know, um, more genes and some children, it's more environment, but virtually in every child, it's genes and environment working together. Right. Okay. Um, and the universal response of a stress cell is to release ATP, okay? And because ATP is so dear and so precious, you know, once it goes out of a cell, it is a, um, it, it's like a, a, you know, a floodlight that, that signals to neighboring cells, I'm in distress, okay? okay. And then that changes how all the other cells respond. And, and actually cells do what nations do when they go to war. They, they harden their borders and don't talk to their neighbors. Okay. Because their neighbors, you know, the neighboring cells and neighboring nations might be, you know, um, well, so in cells might have a virus or, you know, a toxin. Yeah. And so they're, they're walling themselves off. They're not walling themselves. They're just reducing the level of communication with neighboring cells. And so that's a universal. And I thought that if I could rebalance that, you know, so that cells were not releasing ATP, that I'd be able to, um, you know, help, help the children, um, you know, uh, come back to a more normal trajectory of development. Incredible. Um, and, and, they, and their symptoms, you know, the, 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 you know, the core symptoms of autism might um, actually, you know, potentially be dramatically helped. So, um, yeah. And so Suramin is a drug that um, was the only drug available at the time to, uh, you know, that would actually inhibit you know, you know, inhibit ATP signaling. Got it. And that was the first clinical trial, your SAT1 trial. When was that published? We completed the SAT1 trial in, in 2017. Um, and that's, you know, so that's when we, um, uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, so we did the study um, from, it was basically from about, um, August of 2015 to, to February of 2016, and then we published it, you know, over the next year. Oh, that's great. And, um, and I know the burning question for a lot of people is, you know, this sounds so promising. So what's the status of sermon research? Yeah, so that's a, a really exciting story um, that the first sermon autism trial was the, the one that we had did that was a good done that was phase 1b 2a study and it was just 10 children um, with ASD um, and it, what it taught us is that this research is very expensive and so the first clinical trial with those just 10 children was uh, cost 1.2 million dollars um, and I, I put together a, an, a clinical investigation team that you know consisted of over 30 people um, and uh, most of them just donated their time to, to help um, Wow. But the cost of the next studies, the phase two A, B, and say phase three trials, um, will be 
five million to fifty million dollars each, and that's more than my lab can handle. And so um, all the further clinical development was turned over to two new biotech startup companies, Kuzani and Pax Medica. And so Pax Medica has actually completed a phase 2A clinical trial of 52 children with autism spectrum disorder in South Africa. They completed that in 2021. And they were able to, to get approval for the use of Suramen that was made by Bayer and, and still used in Africa. Um, and they uh, under F, they had IRB approval um, at you know six different sites in, in Africa. And they replicated our results in showing that low-dose Suramen was safe and effective for treating the core symptoms of ASD. And those core symptoms, you know, are um, delay of, or, or difficulty with speech and language, difficulty with nonverbal you know, social communication, and then repetitive or, rep or restricted behaviors or interests. And so Pax Medica reported their results at the annual meeting of the Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the AACAP meeting in, in 2021. Unfortunately, because the pandemic came, um, at, you know, um, that slowed progress dramatically, but I'm I'm enthusiastic to report on on you know that the progress is it, it, you know is continuing and that um, Pax Medica is working very hard uh, to manufacture enough sermon for the next clinical trials, right. and they hope to be able to launch a multinational clinical trial in children with autism now in, in 2024. Okay, so a big problem is is you know making um, you know making pharmaceutical grade sermon. And so since our first studies with sermon, interestingly, there've been over a dozen papers now published from all over the world that have looked at the role of ATP signaling and autism and literally every animal model and every human study that has looked at these abnormalities in autism has found them. And so, you know, this is a very ancient and conserved biology that, that is shared by many different organisms. And, you know, even social abnormalities in zebrafish are triggered, that, that are triggered by a expo embryonic exposure to valproic acid have been traced to abnormalities in ATP signaling. So their social approach is abnormal um, and that's caused in part by ATP signaling, danger signaling. Mm -hmm. So, I think, yeah, so so there are, you know, drugs that are being um, developed that are, that are, you know, there are 19 <laughs> different neurogenic receptors, and, and uh, we don't really even know which ones are, are the most important for autism yet, um, but there are ones, you know, that go by names like P2X7 that are being tested in animal models now, um, and so... We're, you know, my hope is that we'll spark a, you know, a drug renaissance, that there'll be, you know, um, new medicines, uh, you know, available um, that work um, in similar ways as Suramen, um, but don't have to be given by intravenous infusion, which Suramen has to be given by right now. So. Got it. Um, and I know the burning question for a lot of families, even though it's in the middle of being researched is sermon available today yeah so no sermon is not available for human use um, to treat autism in the u.s or anywhere else in the world um and it's only approved you know it, it can only be used in irb and federally approved um clinical trials you know so a small amount of pharmaceutical grade sermon that was made by Germany, um, made by by Bayer in Germany, is is kept at the Centers for Disease Control to help treat a handful of cases that of African trypanosomiasis, of, you know, from of patients who have recently traveled from Africa to the U.S. Um, that's a handful of patients a, a year, and and it's. And it's not legal to import or use sermon in the U.S. without explicit FDA approval. And, and parents need to know that when used incorrectly, sermon can cause harm. So it really requires a trained physician to, to be able to give it properly. And in the future clinical trials, you know, we need with you know are we are, are needed to actually um, determine if you know, Suramen is safe and effective in autism. And, you know, if we do it properly uh, with the highest standards of, of medical excellence, then the FDA will have all the information they need to be able to decide um, uh, if, if Suramen um, is a safe and effective treatment for autism. So, um, 
yeah, and then if you know once that happens, and there's no shortcut. Those those studies just have to be done with the best science. And and honestly, you know, we can slow things if we try to cut corners. You know, so it, it just has to go that way. And we're working really hard to do it. And in, in, well, in Pax Medica is so great. I just I appreciate that because you know the safety for our kids is the most important thing. But we want to get there faster. But I guess my next yeah. question is the burning question. You know, have you ever? received any pushback or blocks by the FDA or any other governmental agency uh, for any of this research and the use of ceramide? Yeah, that's a really important question. The answer is no. The, the FDA has always been incredibly helpful and encouraging in all my interactions with them. Um, you know, so this is really not, you know, delayed in any way by, you know, any pushback from the government it is purely the availability of, of sermon and and you know we'll talk about a little you know a little later um how uh the quality of sermon actually matters but you know let's we can go on to the next question i guess yeah well thanks it's really more pandemic related than fda related yeah. so i just want to make yes. that clear so um you know and Folks want to know, is sermon a cure for autism? Yeah. So sermon is not a cure for autism. It's just the first drug of its kind that helps to reset the cell danger response. And that's what I think is universally dysregulated in autism. This class of drugs is entirely new to medicine. Until recently, there was not any incentive to look for or develop antipurinergic drugs. So the, IT, the idea that ATV signaling and metabolism could be a final common denominator in autism and several other complex disorders was just born in, in San Diego in our lab in 2008. You know, it just didn't exist before that. And so inside the cell, as I mentioned, ATP is a that universal energy carrier that's made by mitochondria. But outside the cell, it's a universal danger signal that triggers inflammation and activates microglia in the brain and alters the composition even of the microbiome. So it's it's my hope that that sermon you know will be found to be safety safe and effective for the treatment of the core symptoms of, of autism in these FDA uh, approved clinical trials and. One of the disadvantages of sermon is that it is not absorbed well by mouth and you know must be given by intravenous infusion um, about once a month. Um, another disadvantage is that high concentrations of sermon are toxic, so blood levels need to be monitored. Okay. And sermon can only be given by you know um, clinicians who are skilled in its use. Um, it has to be given in the right dose, the right schedule, um, and the, the right tests have to be um, uh, performed regularly to look for any signs of of uh, you know, of toxicity. So currently, um, this is can you know these all the this can only be done in in um, the context of, of you know clinical trials and um, and it's you know, and right now we don't even know if sermon interacts with common medicines used in you know in children with autism like anticonvulsants for example right. um, and so those tests have to be done as well um, so only the carefully conducted clinical trials will allow doctors to learn how best to use sermon safely in autism right and I just want to make it clear because this is a question we get you know it's not available but there are rumors that Suramin is being available to purchase. And I just want to put your thoughts out there. Yeah, this is a, right. This is hugely important a message that I want to get out to everybody. So Suramin for human use is not available um, for purchase in the United States. Um, it's uh, or anywhere else for any other disease other than African sleeping sickness and river blindness are the two tropical diseases for which it's approved. Private physicians and families can't purchase it or use it legally, and small amounts of sermon, you know, are actually sold to researchers for laboratory use. Okay, however, laboratory sermon is labeled not for human use and is not guaranteed to be free of impurities and safe for humans. Right. So the only pharmaceutical grade sermon that has been approved for use in humans is currently manufactured by Bayer uh, in Germany and is being manufactured now by Pax, Pax Medica. Um, but the, the Bayer source of sermon um, is the one that we used in the, in the first FDA approved clinical trials in the SAT-1, um, 2015 to 16. Um, and, uh, you know, 
there, there are a couple companies, Pax Medica and Kuzani, that have both been working on it, um, uh, uh, producing pharmaceutical grade cerumen, um, but it hasn't been produced in large enough amounts yet uh, for clinical trials. So it's it, the the next next part of my response is something that's that's really important. I need people to understand it. Is, it's critical for people to know that bad batches of cerumen are out there. And I know that some of this bad sermon has been purchased by families in different countries around the world who have actually contacted me after the fact, hoping to give their children, um, give it to their children with ASD. And they did not know it was bad and unwittingly endangered their children by using sermon marked not for human use. Right. So back in the 1990s, a large batch of sermon was made in New York under the contract, under contract with the National Cancer Institute. This is the first time that anyone had tried to make, you know, pharmaceutical grade sermon outside Bayer Labs in Germany. And that batch of sermon had brown colored impurities in it. And those some of those impurities were aromatic amines that the FDA felt might be carcinogenic. And so the FDA restricted the use of that batch of brown sermon to patients who had cancer and who were, you know, part of clinical trials to see if sermon was effective, was an effective treatment um, for cancer. So those batches of sermon did, you know, it was found in the clinical trials did not work as sermon, and that bad sermon was um, does have undesirable pharmacologic properties um, because of the impurities. Okay, so the brown sermon is found, has found its way to several chemical supply houses around the world, and it's for sale for research to, to use in the lab, and, and it's marked not for human use. So I'll just say, no one should use brown sermon. Okay. Okay. So authentic pharmaceutical grade sermon is colorless, okay? Maybe a little tan, but colorless, you know, mostly. And when dissolved in water um, at a 10% solution. So there, another false claim that I, I've heard about sermon is that uh, it's found in pine needles. Okay, that's wrong. That's false. Sermon is a very large, complex, man-made molecule. It's not present in pine needles or any other natural source. I really appreciate you clearing that up, Bob. It's important, you know, uh, we want the research to go quickly, but we also want it to be safe and uh, right. taking extra measures may not be the right, well, isn't the right solution in this scenario. So let's refocus, talk about where Sermon research is and what's going to happen next. Yeah. So the next steps are for com companies that are developing sermon to, to make their own high quality pharmaceutical grade sermon um, and get it FDA approved for use in uh, the next US clinical trials and multinational clinical trials. And so Pax Medica is working on this and hopes to have sermon available um, for new studies um, uh, in the US and around the world um, uh, um, sometime in, in 2024, um, and maybe a little earlier, depending on how things go. But, but 2024 is probably a better management of expectations. And anyone interested in learning more about our research can simply Google Navio Lab and, and click around our website. And if you wanna know more about Pax Medica, just Google them and check out the latest news. Yeah, and we'll put the links at the bottom of this interview when we post it for everyone especially Navio Labs, I, I do follow. So thank you. Um, and, you know, parents are just like, great. Uh, let the research happen. Hurry up already. What can they do now in the meantime? What do you suggest? Yeah. So I, I'd suggest parents with children that are diagnosed with autism today um, should get connected with Taka. I've, I've been so impressed with all the good work that Taka has done for families, you know, helping to guide them to the right resources that they need. Um, and that the Taka, you know, journey guide, the book is just a superb resource and, um, and, and exp you know, exploring other, other resources and, and groups that are on the Taka website is a great way to start. Great. I appreciate you and your work. And it's so important what you're doing. And the fact that you're staying with it, um, monitoring and being a, such a great resource for the research teams looking into this. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, so for everyone, we will link, the links are down below. You can take a look at it, but just uh, I would encourage you to stay connected with the Navia Labs for the updated information. 
So thanks, Bob. I hope you stay well. Thank you. All right. You too, Lisa. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.